This picture, and I think maybe Jan Couch was with me to take it. This is a picture I took in Texas, and I do not even remember when or exactly where. Maybe Jan remembers, but I thought this was a stunning display of this nurseryman's uh, desire to have something look beautiful, because while it might not be too hard to lay out strips of the same color and create this, it certainly is a challenge to do it in a chevron pattern. I thought that was fantastic. And this was from Texas. And all I can assume is that, that this particular uh, nursery owner did not have a lot of disease problems because they had time to just make things beautiful. And that is wonderful. Now, when Irfan asked me to do a talk uh, we didn't really know exactly what might be useful, but IPM was the general topic. And when it really boils down to it, sanitation and propagation are the real basis for a true IPM program. If you're not able to do some of the things to have good sanitation and good methods in propagation, it doesn't matter how many fungicides and bactericides you buy, you will lose money. So this is the beginning step of that. And I'll go through some of the things that are the uh, most important, I think, of course, once I figure out how to hit, there we go. Most important for you to pay attention to. Before I really get started, I wanna thank our sponsors. They are today OHP Partners with Solutions. Pace 49, who's in the midst of, uh, I think they're going to be changing their name a little bit, but they're still really dedicated as OHP is to our industry. And I will say, of course, Syngenta. These are companies among some others that have always supported uh, my efforts in trying to solve your problems. And I think they're some of the very best companies for supporting our industry with all of their added value, not just very, very good products from all three of these. So let's talk about sanitation. It is the very first line of defense. If you ignore sanitation, you're gonna be just doing a losing battle no matter what kind of great products you might decide to use. It really has to be consistent and thorough. So that means it can't be just hit and miss. And essentially every single person in your operation has to understand why they're doing some of these things. It has to be uniform. The best sanitation programs do involve a combination of things. They involve chemical type sanitation, things that are say disinfectants or disinfestants, and also physical means, which means you don't leave a lot of trash hanging around. So that's a physical means of re uh, making things grow a little bit better. In the first place, if something is unsaleable, it needs to be thrown out. It needs not to be stacked up and left on the bench. This is a really excellent way. And as the, some of the entomologists will tell you, it's a great place to grow bugs. It's also a great place to grow diseases. So if it's trash, it needs to go away. If you have dump containers, whether they're big containers like this, took this picture actually in Canada, or a five gallon bucket that's full of diseased leaves, one way or another, get them out of the greenhouse. It is absolutely necessary that you don't just collect the stuff, you actually take it out of there. I looked at a nursery probably about 10 years ago that was growing a lot of basil and anybody who was growing basil and trying to do it organically might find this familiar. They had gone to the trouble to put the plants into plastic bags because as you're taking a crop out that might be trash, it is scattering the disease particles, all of the spores around the greenhouse. So you're actually helping the disease spread. So bagging it at times is a really good idea, especially on something like downy mildew. Now we should be using as much as possible reusable flats. If you are able to do that, they need to be cleaned. And cleaned does mean, you see here the cells that still have potting media in it. Cleaned does mean cleaned. It means they actually look clean. So it's not a matter of you absolutely have to have labs checking these things all the time, but you really do need to try and get them as clean as possible. You cannot take a flat like this one where the cursor is and dunk it into a disinfectant and not have minimal results because of all of the potting media that's still stuck in it. If you take this flat that's been cleaned to the point where at least it looks pretty good, then you will have maximum benefit from your disinfectant. We did do some work when we were in California with a nursery, I think that they were in the uh, middle of the country somewhere, I can't remember exactly where, but they were doing a lot of reusing of flats and that was a very good thing for them to do, but they wanted to test and see what the different methods would do. And in this case, we actually had a Pythium that was resistant to Subdumax. So we were able to find 
the Pythium that was making it through sanitation. You see here in this first bar, the untreated flats, there were 24 colonies in the little test that we did. If all you did was wash them, you knocked it down about 80%. So that's pretty impressive if you would simply wash these things before you use them again. Then they were doing various times with Green Shield at that point, different rates, they got 100% control. They actually stacked the flash though, you know, nested them so it wouldn't take up too much space and they wouldn't have to make a huge amount of a treatment solution. When you do that, even if you want to soak them overnight, it is not going to be as effective. You can see some snuck through. But when they were unstacked, you got a great uh, job of cleaning it up, even to the point where it wasn't soaked, it was a dip. And as a dip, we really do mean in and out. So cleaning and disinfecting is very critical. And you'll probably recognize that. And I know Joe and Foster will as part of the mantra from PACE. So that's an important thing to do. Some of the first work that we did working with PACE was looking at cleaning different surfaces from two very bad plant pathogens, both fungi. We did use old material, we wanted to make sure we were looking at things that would be more like what you might have to work against. And this is uh, some plastic, some polyethylene, concrete and wood. And we just checked them in a big series of trials looking at wiping out Flaviopsis, which is black root rot, and also I'll show you some summary slides of the fusarium. So two of the very hardest diseases to wipe out. In this case, what we did is we compared just water treatment. So that would be like the control. We used clean grow, compared it to green shield, another quaternary ammonium product that's in a different level of uh, class, and then also zero tall. And looking at the wood, and it was just treating the wood with water alone, what we've got here is absolutely no control which is understandable. When we use the cleaner, the cleaner in this case is strip it. 85% control when it was just strip it. But as you start looking at clean grow and strip it being used together, we're seeing 100% control, which was better than the green shield or the um, zero tall. And then looking at concrete, you actually could clean the concrete brilliantly just with the strip it did a great job all on its own. But again, we were seeing very, very high levels of control when we did the two-step program where we looked at both the cleaner first, like strip it, and then the clean grow. So same kind of trial, but I'm gonna show you the data on the fusarium really quickly here. In this case, um, the on treating wood, the strip it wasn't as effective in killing fusarium, but the two together, clean grow and the strip it, we got 100%. And then looking at um, plastic again, plastic actually, as you would suspect, is much easier to clean. So there's a lot of things that gave us 100% control. And then finally, the concrete. And in concrete, once again, the uh, we were able to do 100%. As you can imagine, the strip it on the concrete, it sits there and it just does its job. So this gave us an, a really good idea of how you can do some sanitation in the in between the crops. So you have, if you have an outbreak, this is the kind of thing that you could do to stop it from just continuing because fusarium and Thalaviopsis especially simply continue. They are soil borne and they're on the surfaces in particles and they live for a long time without a plant. So you really have to be aware of carrying problems through. The next section that we did look at was the ability of different products to control algae. Algae is a problem on a lot of things. And I'm showing you the dramatic problem you can get on some plant material, especially on tropicals, because the conditions that tropical plants like this Apollander or zebra plant want to have to grow a good plant, so does the algae, very, very happy. So we started looking at what do you do to control it in your water? If you're in a propagation situation, you always have a lot of water. That is what helps us get roots on plants or get germination. If you do that and you are reusing water, I'm first place, I'm gonna pray for you because you ought not be reusing any water in prop. Any place else, yep, you can do it. But in propagation, if you are having to recycle water, then you do need to treat it. We were looking at the comparison of X3, which is now, uh, well, it was called Zeroton originally, but we're looking at X3 compared to Zerotol. And we, you can see here kind of an example, and you know, not only growers can grow algae, we were great at growing it on our benches. And you can see I'm using a lot of the same materials for the benches that you might end up having to use. But what we found out 
is that really, and I would still say this, this work is probably from 15 years ago, but I would say that I still believe that this is the best allergy control. The B treatment here is Xerotol. It has been in all of our trials and in everything else I've looked at, just excellent on algae control. The X3 is not doing obviously anywhere near as good. So all we have here are little chunks of Osmocote to feed the algae and then the water. But what happens if you treat your irrigation water with uh, one of these two things and put it out over the plants? Well, if these, these plants were uh, snapdragons, this is snapdragons that were treated with Xerotol in them. In, this is reg registered labeled rate going into the irrigation water. Here's X3, clearly much safer. This is stock or Mattiola, same kind of picture. You can create extremely poor looking uh, vincas if you wish to use Xerotol over the top of them versus the X3. X3 is much safer in this particular delivery system, even though, as I showed you, it is not going to be as good on algae control. However, one thing that you could do, and I obviously like periodically to make sarcastic statements, so I'm going to warn you, I'm going to make a sarcastic statement here. This is lavender that had xanthomonas, and the ones that were in the water that was treated with X3 actually grew out of it. They actually were recovered from it. So it did a good job of controlling it and you had a crop. The Xeratol treated plants also actually did not have Xanthomonas anymore because the Xeratol killed them. So you do have some multiple things that can happen here. You can kill diseases and damage your crop or you can kill diseases and have a good crop. So there is not going to be one single answer of what you should be using. Now, luckily, since we quit doing a lot of that work about 10 or 11 years ago, Pace has gone ahead and worked with quite a few other people. This is Dr. Mike Evans, who was at University of Arkansas. And he was simply looking at algae control in lettuce plug production. As you can imagine, lettuce is super sensitive to just about everything. But the percent control was really interested to see, interesting to see. This is copper at 0.2 parts per million, 40% control of the algae, higher rate, better control. Looking at chlorine dioxide, it was better and then going up to a half a part per million of chlorine dioxide, 82% control. Clean grow at two parts per million was 90% control. And if you used four parts, it's 98. If all you're doing here is algae control with water treatment, clearly this was the best product in Dr. Evans' trial. What did it do to the plants? Plants were not exceptionally happy with four parts per million of clean grill. Here is the untreated basil and the treated basil. At four parts per million, it's too much. We have a little bit of damage also on the spinach and on the lettuce. Then you'll remember this was at 98% algae control. If you also then look at two parts per million, you now have pretty, it was, just, it was safe on both the lettuce and on the spinach. And the basil, interestingly enough, really still didn't like it. So I, I just honestly, we need to quit growing basil. It's about all I can say. It's a terrible plant for trying to grow anything and get away from disease and not hurt the plant. But you can see this two part per million in that water was very, very effective. And that's irrigation water. So sanitation isn't always, it should not be about cleaning things up after a disaster occurs. It really ought to be preventative in some cases. And if you consider that, um, you know, just hate to use, well, I don't really hate to use it. Everybody is paying attention to the COVID outbreak to some degree or in some fashion, and we are playing cleanup now, and it will never be as successful as if we had been able to stop it originally. So you just need to remember that anything is easier to prevent than to clean up after the fact. So let's look at one of the th reasons that propagation is such a problem. It's a problem because of certain characteristics that happen. You get cuttings and seeds at, at different frequencies that have problems. And so they come to you with problems. Sometimes you can tell they've got one and sometimes you can't. We also have characteristics in propagation that lead to disease. And those characteristics are water, a lot of water going in prop very high humidity, even if you manage to not have too much water. There is real poor air movement, which again goes back to 
too much water. It, it's essentially the best thing and the exact way that I make disease happen when I'm doing a trial. The handling causes wounds. So things like botrytis are really happy in uh, propagation, especially where you get them on a bench and you start growing and you don't have as many problems. Then the next thing you can do, and we'll talk a little bit about it, is the water treatment. Again, we've talked a little bit about water treatment and we'll give you a little bit more information on that. We're gonna talk about some of the research we've done with dipping. And I spent a good, well, I guess 38 years or 39 years saying don't dip stuff. And now I have to take it back and I'll show you why in a few minutes, exactly why I think you do have some choices now for dipping to get control in some propagation diseases. There's also some problems if you use chemicals in propagation. And the biggest one, as you can imagine, is if you're trying to put roots on an unrooted cutting and you stop it, you may stop disease, but if you stop roots from forming, you no longer, you have no crop. So clearly you have to pay attention to more than just stopping the disease. And finally, let's get them out of prop as fast as possible. So I'm gonna show you some of the research we've done and other people on promoting root development, promoting plant health and getting them out of prop quickly. Cause the whole key to it is that you shorten the exposure in that really high disease conducive uh, situation. So we will look at some growth promoter research, which growth promoters being things that actually manage to help the plant in a variety of ways, put roots on faster. So in the first place, we still are doing a lot of this. And it's interesting that, you know, I, I was talking to somebody not too long ago who said that it used to be in his experience, and he is younger than me, but not by much. And he said in his experience, that the plant material now is worse than it used to be. And I'm thinking, I'm sorry, I started at University of Florida in 1979 and propagation material was always garbage. It was always full of stuff. So as a plant pathologist, that's great. It's exciting to look at new stuff all the time, but as a nurseryman, it really is bad. So you really have to pay attention. If you do have plants you're taking cuttings from, make an effort to not propagate weeds at the same time. And really you have to look at these not as meaningless plants, but as very important plants to you because you need to keep them healthy so that everything from then on is healthy. There are some fungi and bacteria that are easily and routinely seed borne. And I'm showing you one of the best examples here. These are zinnia seeds. They have this particular picture up at the top, a combination of Alternaria and Xanthomonas. And this is really, it's not as common as it used to be, but it is really a common problem in terms of seed borne diseases. If you have seedlings that come up and you see spots on the cotyledons, then you have a, a reasonable chance that you've got a seed borne disease. Treating these at any point from now on will be a catch up game. So it's gonna be hard. And if you, can get a lab to do it and check seeds out. You can see, this was quite a long time ago, but this is a bunch of seed that had xanthomonas. All of these yellow slimy colonies are xanthomonas and all of the gray ones are alternaria. So if you start off with bad stuff, you got just about no chance at all to end up with something that isn't bad. One of the reasons that we're having newer problems all the time. I'm showing you an example right here. And what could I possibly be showing you? I got nothing against FedEx, except they're too late, too late to, in the last year. They just don't deliver junk when they're supposed to. But here's the issue. We now, in the last 20 years and even more every year, pull plants from all over the world and they get to us overnight. That means that all the problems that they have in South Africa and Costa Rica and Brazil we're getting them immediately. And indeed, we actually send them to them too. So this is an issue because it means that there's no such thing as we don't have it here. We do have it here. We're getting it brought in just about daily. So I started looking uh, years ago at what's coming in in seeds. These Sutera cuttings, this bag was opened by me. So it came to me with absolutely no handling except at the farm where it originated. All this white stuff, this is pythium. And these are unrooted cuttings. And you wanna say, fine, they didn't have any roots. So where did the pythium come from? Well, it had to be getting on them in the process of taking the cuttings. Other things that we're able to prove absolutely did come on cuttings. This is Pseudomonas on a salvia. So this is not uncommon. 
This is downy mildew on coleus. I have seen that myself again in unopened bags. So it didn't magically get it from being in my lab. It had this problem when it was put in the bag. And I was a stunned to find that on one case, we looked at geraniums and the base, which was not looking like this at the time, it had pythium on the base of an unrooted geranium cutting, which is unbelievable to me how you managed to do that. But we are, in essence, really bringing a lot of problems in and making our life miserable by not controlling them down line or, or at the source, actually. I've talked to a lot of poinsettia growers over the year, and we'll switch over to why is propagation such a problem. It's the water. I've heard a lot of people say that they can grow poinsettias pretty well with no Irwinia problems as long as they really, really stay on top of the amount of water, as long as they stop the overnight watering as fast as possible. If you don't, you get Irwinia. And I can tell you from my experience in trying to stop Irwinia that it is damn hard to stop. It is not something you can just, oh, well, let's go in there and spray it with something and it's gonna stop it. If you water wrong, you don't manage your water really, really well, you will end up with problems. These alyssum seedlings are damping off from Pythium. This is too much water or watered at the wrong time of day. One way or another, it boils down to being too much water. And here is a scary list of all the stuff that we know for a fact can be seed borne, as in coming in on whether it's a seed or a leaf cutting, a bulb, uh, unrooted cuttings. So you don't have to be bringing things in that are already rooted to bring a problem in. That's a huge number of things to have to worry about. And you'll notice that we actually, and anybody who was growing uh, petunias about, I guess it was six or seven years ago, big outbreak of tobacco mosaic virus. We definitely can bring viruses in this way too. So be aware that this is something that you really will have to stay aware of what can happen or you're just gonna get caught flat-footed. Here's another picture. This is amazing. These, these plants, I did pull this out of a trash can. I'll give the nurseryman that much. It was in a trash can. But this is Rhizoctonia. And Rhizoctonia, especially in your kind of environment where a lot of you have a lot of heat in, in part of the year, the, the speed with which it moves is really, really fast. If you imagine somehow that you could use these kind of plugs, these impatience up at the top and get away with it, you're nuts because what will happen is they will turn into this. And then you will have what I like to call expensive trash. You have now put it in a big pot and you will not stop it. It is too happy. Same kind of thing here. This was done, so that picture I showed you a minute ago was in Texas. This was in California. This is Rhizoctonia as well, Osteospermum, some Vinca minor. All of these, clearly you're not gonna try and grow them, but how about this? Do you think these guys are safe to grow? If you don't throw this whole flat out, you're going to have nothing but problems from then on. Everything, at least within one or two cells of this, already has it. So you need to get used to the idea to cut your losses, get rid of stuff when you start seeing this kind of an outbreak. Same idea with poinsettia cuttings. How many of you would like to rescue something in this area. You don't see very many that look good, but maybe you think that one looks okay because it's not, well, this one's looking pretty bad because it's drooping, losing leaves. This one doesn't look too bad. It's got a really nice leaf. Guess what this one has? It has rice octonia. You keep it, you pot it up. This is what you're gonna get. You could get this right off the bat. And if this is all that happens to you, you're lucky because this plant had rice octonia inside the stem and it was a six inch pot. Now you have a plant that you've grown for another, what, two or three, well, not two or three months, but probably a month or so, and it's still trash. Don't use stuff that looks bad. Likewise, if you collect bad looking leaves off of poinsettias, this is uh, botrytis. I think it's admirable to collect the leaves and get them out of there. But this is a picture I took. This one I think was, uh, this was in Ohio. These geranium leaves were piled up between the flats. So while these are off of the flats, they're sitting there making spores very happily and they're still spreading. You need to get them out of there. This is what you're doing to yourself in propagation. And this is something we pay more attention to and it's probably the least likely place you're gonna have a problem. This was an automatic uh, shearing machine using a lot of the flats to get them, you know, keep them around a little bit longer. 
cleaning this is important, but it's not as important as some of those other things I showed you. You cannot come here and say, fine, I recognize this is a problem. I'm going to keep this uh, cutting instrument clean, but I'm not going to do the other things that really need to be done, like don't over water. This is a picture of our greenhouse that we had, one of them, in uh, Northern California for years. And this is what I did to make disease happen. Can you imagine the trouble you have to go to as a plant? But I mean, I'm absolutely incompetent. They should teach us how in school to make diseases and theoretically they do. But between these foggers, the plastic bags and everything else, it was amazing how hard it was to make disease happen. But mist and water are key. If in propagation, you can use something like Rime where you can keep the humidity up without getting leaves very wet and get those roots on them, but not wet leaves, then you're going to have a much better time controlling diseases, much, much better. And if you don't wanna buy that, here's a low tech thing. Obviously foliage plants will tolerate a lot of grief more than some of the bedding plants. And this grower was using newspaper to hold some humidity in there without really having sopping wet leaves. So there's a lot of ways to consider it, but water management is absolutely critical. Absolutely, more than almost any other thing you can stop or start a disease based on how you water. So if we say fine, maybe you did a really good job. Let me show you some research that we did because we probably, most of us have a tendency to think that if we can control a disease, we don't have anything else to worry about in terms of say propagating the plant. In this trial, we did a um, comparison of different fungicides, a few different ones, you can see them on the bottom, for did it control the cylindricladium cutting rod on the azaleas? And then also wanted to see, fine, if it controlled it, what happened with whether or not the plants actually managed to root? Because controlling rot and having no roots doesn't help you. So what we saw is that medallion did a pretty darn good job when it was, it's about 50% 50, 50 control, which is for that disease, not too bad. Medallion being sprayed on the stock plants was even more effective. We had a much better level. So this is being sprayed the day before the cuttings were taken. Root Shield doing really well. And then Camelot also really good. But what happens when you go ahead and see, did you get any roots on anything? And what we can see is that the cylindricladium was really detrimental to things rooting. That makes sense. But unfortunately, so was medallion it stopped root formation to some degree. Root shield wasn't quite as good as the um, non-inoculated plants in terms of putting on roots, but it was certainly a lot better than the super effective medallion for controlling cylinder cladium. And then Camelot was uh, really bad for, and this is the old Camelot. This is not current one. This was original one from quite a while ago. So you can stop roots. That sounds like a really sad side effect. We also, let's see, bulb dips. This is some of the stuff that I chose not to agree with for a lot of years. And again, Foster and Joe will know that that's true. But this work was done in Canada, really nice work. Work looking at uh, daffodils that were grown commercially. So this is not a laboratory test. This is uh, field grown stuff. And they took bulbs right out of the field, out of the soil, and they did some treatment. So this is a soak and I don't remember how long, I think it was five minutes. And it just showed the percent survival of the bulb, not the pathogen, but of the bulb was only 71% when it was untreated. But when it was soaked with clean grow at one of these two rates, it was up to 95%. The number that had fusarium was, uh, was correlated with whether or not you did the soak. Cause you can see here, we also got really good control with that soak. And which is interesting to me because this is a, a systemic fusarium but the clean grow is cleaning up a lot of the problem on the surface with a soap. Unfortunately, and this is something that we are seeing, you can get too high. You can slow things down. So you have to have the correct rate on these products. Here we have good growth, better than the controls when we had clean grow at the lower rate. At the higher rate, we actually stunted them a little bit. And I say we science, not me. We didn't do those trials. So then we looked at some stuff on tulips. So how about tulips? In this case, uh, Dr. Elmhurst, who's the researcher in Canada, looked at two 
different cultivars, one that was super susceptible to fusarium and one that was really resistant. So you see the same kind of picture here, really good control with a clean grow uh, soak. In this case, not quite, it's kind of a weird reversal here, but that happens with statistics. The number diseased, and then looking at the height, we're seeing that even though the these um, the higher rate was good for the height on the susceptible tulips. But what if you take a tulip that's not susceptible? It's in essence, it's resistant. Now we see no disease on the resistant ones, regardless of being soaked in water or nothing. And that makes some sense because they're resistant. And we then look at height. And again, we're seeing a little bit of significant stunting with the higher rate. So this actually is a rate that we were using in our trials most recently with soaking bulbs or cuttings with clean grow. And here's the one thing, and I believe that uh, Judy McWhorter is the one that got me to do this, but here's the one thing that answers what I've been worried about for as long as I have. This is bulb water from just water. This is what the water looked like, what grew out of it when it was a one mil of clean grow per liter. And this is what happened at two mils. What we've got here is just a few colonies of fungi. The fuzzy ones are fungi. And this is a different kind of bulb. And you see the same picture. So my fear for years has been and had plenty of proof that you can move pathogens in dip water. If you have clean grow in the dip water, you're not going to because it's killing all the organisms in the dip water. So this is a way to get away from the problems without damaging, if you use the right rate, without damaging the plant. This, by the way, see this one right down here? That's one colony. So in essence, we have three bacteria here. It's, it's not as bad as it looks because there's really only three and they grew all over because they didn't have any competition. So what does it mean for disease control? We didn't have any disease on these caladiums, but this is what the caladiums look like that were dipped in water. That's what they look like that were dipped in clean grow. What do you think? It's something, isn't it? Surprised the heck out of me. I did not expect to see this kind of thing. We think this is partly due to the wetting capacity of the clean grow. So there's something going on there that's not just killing the um, bad bacteria and fungi. We looked at some unrooted cuttings, not a whole heck of a lot, but these were hydrangea cuttings. You can see the bundles that we got from the grower. These bundles were treated just like this. We did not break them out of their little bundles and treat them. So they, we did a similar trial and that's what they looked like to begin with. And this is what happened when we dipped and we're using the higher rate here. You can see that two mil per liter rate. When we dipped them for 30 seconds, we definitely had an improved rooting. Definitely, it was statistically better than just water dip. However, when we dipped them for 60 seconds, we heard them. So this is going to be something you're going to have to figure out based on the exact crops you're growing. And I'm sure that Pace could help you with, and that, and that ends up being me helping you with where to start on the different crops. But that was really pretty stunning to see that we could actually improve the plant quality and get them moved out of prop faster and safely by using clean grow. Some of the other work I'm sure you've heard about for many years, the plant health aspects of pageant and orchestra and empress. And I'm gonna show you some, also some other data that shows what boils down to being plant health benefits from the other strobel urines as well. But this trial was one we did with ranunculus seeds in California. And what we saw here is 42% covering the flat. So not great uh, flat coverage when it came to just, you know, no treatment. The pageant ones, we had 50% more growth essentially. And this was a one time, well, two time, two times spray, but it's a spray, heavy spray the day they were planted with four ounces per hundred gallons of pageant. And then two weeks later, the same thing. The medallion subdue, which was the grower standard at that time was pretty bad because what happened is they ended up with too much chemicals being done in that fashion. The seed had been treated previously and then they were sprenched again and it hurt them. Interestingly, Root Shield Plus 
spectacular response here. They were the best plants in the trial, got really excellent. And this was a one-time sprench or heavy spray basically at the day of planting. That's it. 74% of the flat covered. So since we like to do more things, we did more trials with that, but we also did solidago, which is goldenrod, to see what we would get with a kind of soft cutting, something like the hydrangeas. And what we saw, this was after they had been treated, again, it's the same kind of treatment. We definitely improved the rooting, how many of them rooted within, um, with that first treatment of subdue max and medallion. However, the pageant, and the root shield plus were higher. They were statistically better. And then if we came back and rooted, rated them again, you see what actually happened. They continued to root a little bit there. They definitely reached the same level with the subdue max medallion and very high. What this shows me, I mean, the important point here, I think is that honestly, if you had used pageant or root shield plus, you'd have them out of there faster because one month is in between here to here. It took them another month to put on the roots that was then comparable to what we saw with the immediate rating or not immediate, but the first rating with pageant intrinsic or root shield plus. So you get them out of mist and out of crop faster, you get them away from disease conditions faster. This is some work that uh, Syngenta did and it shows you, this was on poinsettias, the effect of a one-time heritage spray at two ounces. So the ones on the top are non-treated and there are definitely more roots on these treated uh, poinsettia cuttings. They did a similar trial with Mural. Mural has a zoxystrobin in it and another compound and it also was absolutely great at putting roots on the plants. This is a four ounce spray. Anytime you can do a spray, it's clearly gonna be easier to manage. But the fact is you get something out of prop faster and you took it away from all the water and all the really stress that could be happening. So it's really important for you to do that kind of thing and control these things. So as a summary, my summary is don't use contaminated seeds or cuttings, okay? Y'all will tell me that you're gonna use them because that's all you get. Okay, fine, but you better know what you're fighting and get something put on them right off the bat. Otherwise, it's just gonna come back and be a problem the whole time. Be careful about what fungicides or water treatments you use on unrooted cuttings. I've shown you that you can cause problems with disinfectants, water disinfectants. You can cause problems with some fungicides. And it's not just the one I happened to show you because others there, there are others that do it. But likewise, you can actually use some of them and get them out of prop faster and not cause any problems. If you recycle water, you better treat it. Don't use it in propagation, honest to goodness. This is just the dumbest thing you can possibly do. All you're doing is setting your whole nursery up for disaster if you recycle water in prop. Just don't do it. You gotta manage the water. You know that if you've been growing poinsettias and trying to root the cuttings. Um, the direct stick thing that's going on now in the last, what, five years or so on poinsettia cuttings, that looks like it's brilliant. I don't know how universal everybody is with that, but that is really good because you basically have taken them out of prop right off the bat. So it's really good. So the amount of water and when you water is really critical and the way you water. Get them out of prop fast, as fast as possible. And truthfully, I think there's a lot of data that's showing that root shield plus and a strobal urine, including heritage, mural, pageant, can absolutely shorten the time in propagation. And I've seen demonstrations um, that I did at grower operations where the products also make them resistant to stress, which could be drought, it could be heat, it could be cold. So they really are very, very beneficial. So they're not, ha not only controlling a disease, they are giving you some real growth benefits and shortening the time in propagation. And you know, please don't try and cure trash. Trash is trash. You guys, you know, I have made my career now 41 years in it working with this stuff, but I hate seeing you guys waste your money. Please throw things away when they really ought to be thrown away. Trying to keep stuff doesn't work. I know I said a big nursery uh, in California years ago and they had the whole fields lined with 
stacked up trash, you know, stuff that they couldn't. And their management had determined, and, and clearly not the people who were growing anything, but the uh, economists, whoever the heck they were, had determined that they could not throw more than a certain percentage away a week. So they stacked it up so that they would not exceed that. The best thing I saw in response to that was one of the growers at a different operation, same big company, they had burned the plants down with Roundup. And I said, yep, that'll do it. Now you do not have disease and insects coming right back in your nursery because you're storing it next to the stuff you're trying to sell. So I wanna thank again, these sponsors. These are people who have very, very clearly over a very long time uh, been dedicated and they have supported my programs and whatever goofy ideas I might have or suggestions to do things. And I really appreciate them and I hope you do too. And these are not the only people obviously, but these are the ones that uh, I managed to find logos on for the time being. At any rate, thanks again for uh, all of your support to these companies.